Well, look who it is, my darling soul brother, Dr. Gregory Dunn. How are you, my love? Hello, hello, namaste. Hello, my lovely Carrie Ann, and hi, everyone joining us. Well, we've got a juicy topic today. I tell you, there's been some buzzing, hasn't there, in the background? Well, in the foreground, too. But uh, so many people are keen for this conversation and about sacred erotica. And I feel you and I can speak to it because we, we will bring in medical, we will bring in philosophical, spiritual. Uh, it's, it's a delicate subject matter, but it's something that needs to be spoken of, particularly at this time, because as we anchor the golden age of Gaia, we are all going to experience a profound sexual awakening. And there's been so much distortion on the planet for the last few thousand years, possibly longer, we don't really know. We can we can sort of tune into what, what the timelines are, but definitely in the last few thousand years. I would say since Atlantis, because I think in Atlantis we were we were very liberated in our sexuality. We were having mystery schools, temple cultures. We'd probably run off at night from the temples and make love all night and, you know, be in that uh, ecstica, ec ecstasy and euphoria and... Then something went really wrong and then the perversion came in and the distortion came in and the pornography came in. And I think as the antidote to that, we saw a lot of spiritual practitioners using uh, celibacy. And then, of course, people would get into spirituality and they'd feel so guilty because they still had all these sexual urges and impulses and you know, particularly in our yoga culture, it's like, what do you do with that? We hear about brahmacharya, and, you know, contain the sexual energy. But you and I definitely feel, um, as Scorpio and Dromedon and star seeds, we feel, wow, no, we need to harness this. We need to merge those polar opposites together of yin and yang because that's what creational energy is. It's, it's about the sexual impulse because when you look at what births creation, well, of course, it's orgasmic bliss. That's actually who we are at our fundamental decoded level so we're going to dive deep in look at the distortion and look at how we can come back into sacred geometrical alignment when it comes to our sexuality what an intro Woof, love it i'm already excited <laughs> no no pun intended <laughs> that's all right this is the show if you if you want to be excited today's the day <laughs> let's, just, let's just let everyone know we have we have been best friends for over 20 years over now 20 i guess years, yeah. i think we were married in a past life so um and we've still got married to someone life. else in this life so you know what are you going to do about it <laughs> you know i'll start off by sharing as soon as you said the word delicate i thought ooh, i was almost triggered by it but i i do agree with what you say that it's a delicate so uh content matter to talk about but I also think that it, it didn't always, it wasn't always delicate and perhaps it doesn't need to be delicate. Um, I think the word delicate can sometimes mean sensitive, AKA it's highly potent. The, the content matter is potent. It's not a throwaway subject when you're talking about sex, intimacy, um, and when you're connecting to your sexuality. But it's also something that I believe we've been programmed to hold a lot of guilt and shame templates around and we're going to i'm so excited to delve into this today because i know you agree with me carrie and i i having that guilt and shame ironically prevents you from living in a in a state of sacred erotica where you are able to tap into your kundalini whether that's with a twin flame whether that's in another sexual union or just with yourself but we must remember that this is all to do with that cosmic orgasmic energy of kundalini um, and i think the more we can open this subject up yes it can be delicate but when we can liberate ourselves from those constraints um, then we'll be able to i guess talk about it in such a free liberated way and for someone who lived, who has lived an interesting, and I know you have too, an interesting life, aka my relationship to my sexuality and sexual partners has been really interesting to kind of observe from a spiritual way, my humanity with that. Um, and I know you're the same. There's so much to learn from it. But I'm, I'm excited because... Um, it, this is something I love to talk about. I do talk about it with patients in my clinic. I talk about it with you regularly. And let's open it up to the to the crew, to the family of my health. Um, yes, we are the 
you know, the trainers. And yes, we have um, this this platform with My Health, but ask us anything. We're going to go there today, and I'm excited. Yeah, and I feel like our trainees know that we're very mischievous and naughty and there's going to be a lot of sexual jokes and, you yeah. know, referring it back to sacred sexuality for the pure joy that it actually is and, and not to have that shame around it. And I love what you say. We can explore that within any sexual relationship, whether it be soulmates, twin flames, or indeed with yourself. And the sister science to yoga, of course, is Tantra. And there's so many beautiful sex magic practices, tantric practices, simply going outside, laying naked on the earth, feeling the telluric energy, the magnetic energy of, of Mother Gaia coming through you as a pulsation code. And then at the same time, transcoding from the central sun as another pulsation code. And those two merge together as one. And you can have profound cosmic orgasms just alone with pure elemental forces. It is so mm. powerful. And, mm. and really, I believe that if people have sexual distortion uh, because of whether it be they've been abused, they've maybe been the abuser. I know, I actually know people that have also been the abuser and are carrying so much shame around that. Mm. Uh, they've been told that their sexuality is shameful, they must shut it down. The, the list could go on when we look at the distortion. Um, but if you start with just pure delight within yourself and allow that blossoming within the chakra system, because really that's what cos cosmic orgasm is. It comes up from the base chakra. It's not contained in the base chakra. We're not just quelling that, that primal urge in the base chakra. When it comes to cosmic orgasm, it erupts as that flowering process through all of the chakras, ultimately to come through the crown chakra. And they're the seven chakras we know about within the physical body that relate to the physical endocrine system. But we would go as far as to say there's 12 chakras. So we've got that earth star chakra, and then we go into our soul star chakra, up into causal star, galactic star, and all the way through to the monad, all the way through to the singularity. And it's so powerful because once you're in cosmic explosion, once you're in alignment, and that's what pure alignment geometrical coding with the divine is about, then you are just conducting constantly creational bliss codes within you. And it's, it is a service to humanity. It is a service to collective to be in deep, deep pleasure. We've forgotten that. We're, so, we're in such a chaotic realm and we've got these dark lords coming at us, siphoning off our life force. And it's like um, maybe we just need to get back to simplicity and allow ourselves to have pleasure. It's been taken away from us, that permission just to have pleasure. Um, so even mm. if you start just at the basics, have a beautiful bath, light candles for yourself. Doesn't have, You don't have to have a cosmic orgasm today, everyone, everyone mm. listening. Um, but, you know, that's really what it's about. And as you said, it's the kundalini forces. So I'll let you have a ch bit more of a chat about kundalini, Greg, because I know as a yogi that's and as a, as a senior acupuncturist, mm. that's something you know mm. a lot about, Meridian's kundalini chakra. The word, yeah. the word sacrum comes from, I'll throw in a little fun fact here, comes from the Latin sacra. And there's a connection there between the sacred as we know it in the yogic world and also the sacrum. A lot of our physiology in anatomy and physiology comes from, well, the terminology comes from Latin roots. So uh, the sacrum itself is sacred. And that's because it holds, yeah, as you said, Carrie, the, the kundalini, that essential potential kind of energy. Um, really good comment there from, g'day Kyle, how you doing? And thanks everyone for joining us already. But a really nice comment there from Kyle, who is discussing his sensation in the sacral chakra and feels as if there's that energy building. In my mind uh, or in my heart, that that shows me that you're you're now connecting to that kundalini in a sacred way. Um, I believe that for a lot of us, as we go through our kind of adolescence and then as we maybe become a little bit uh, explorative sexually, whether that's late teens or early uh, early 20s, whenever it is. For me, it was more late 20s, early 30s. Um, as we start to explore that, there's a moment that we have to start connecting uh, to, our, to our urges, that primal urge. And there's a difference between, I guess, um, a connection which I'll say is not sacred and a connection which is. But I'm also here to say I've had both. I'm very open about that, and Carrie-Anne has as well. Um, 
there is a lot of people who have had history with abuse, but there's also a lot of people who've had um, transactional sexual relationships, all right? So we know what transactional love is. Um, I'm staying with my husband because I can't afford to leave the marriage. You know, that could be an example of a transactional love or sexual relationship. Or it could be an addiction to something like pornography. It could be an addiction to even sexting these days. You know, you might have a secret friend that you sext with online. And this is, again, clouded with so much guilt and shame. But from that yogic perspective, as Carrie Ann said, it, it's not necessarily sacred. So that's something that's more of a connection that you're asking for something to feed you. You're asking for validation. It comes from a place of almost that victim mentality. So, yeah, Kyle, I, I feel like, let me just have a quick look at what you said. Bill, yeah, I, I can only speak for myself. And I guess I've, I've asked a few people about this when I talk about kidney energy in Chinese medicine, sexual energy. For myself, learning to have a solo experience in a way that wasn't just to reach orgasm, but was to, I guess, explore the sexual energy and feel my sexual energy, you know, and that's to do with 3D as well, what feels good for you, getting to know how your body responds and what parts of your body feels good. And it's not just the sexual organs too. It could be other areas of your body that feel good. Um, I think a lot of that comes from solo experiences. So I hope I answered your question, Carl, but a really, really good um, indication that you're connecting to that um, Kundalini. I love the comment from Gloria, who we know mm. is one of our beautiful graduates, and she is uh, from Brazil. And I know when I travel to Brazil, it it's just, oh, it's sexual delight, really. There's, they're very overt in their exploration of their sexuality and their sensuality, and it can be quite triggering for pe many people. Mm -hmm. um, and, yes, Gloria, you're right, in Australia, it, it is a big taboo. There's, uh, it's funny because you think Australia, with all the flesh that we that we constantly are showing, because it's a hot climate, so we're we're always getting around in bikinis, and um, <laughs> the men are getting around in their board shorts and chests out, and yet there still is this sense of. Um, routine I guess with with sex that you get into a, a monogamous relationship and then you know you have sex once or twice a week and and it's all very it's all very contained and then of course you have these secret lives to really explore what you want to actually explore and I think in some of these other countries it's it's more overt it's more out there it's more acceptable like the European countries um, of course, that also means that they can easily go into distortion as well. And so that's what we're exploring today. Where is the middle ground with all of these energies? Where can Where's we the not? Truth? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and you can... got to remember, we come from that English heritage, some of us, you know, the, there yeah. is that, um, you know, dark kind of energy that comes from some of our heritage. Of course, we've got a beautiful blend now in um, in Australia or in, you know, with First Nations and with many different European and Asian, all of the other cultures that we have in Australia. But there's still, I know growing up, there was still those kind of English influences coming through of the prim and proper, of the prude. And as you say, Carrie Ann, the, the confines of, I was just chatting with someone yesterday, um, a patient about this, um, a fabulous book called Committed by Elizabeth Gilbert, a book that I read prior to getting married because I never wanted necessarily to get married and I also didn't want to come into it from a template of um, confinement and having to just do what everyone else does. So, again, that book is called Committed by Elizabeth Gilbert. She's the author of Eat, Pray, Love, and it is fabulous. She tours the world and with an interpreter chats to all these remote cultures about sex and marriage and whether how they intertwine and and honestly the english were really the first people to put on a white wedding dress have a wedding cake have bridesmaids and it's really a capitalist view on marriage there's many cultures where sex is purely to create children or for a ceremonial event there's plenty of cultures where that works, where arranged marriage works, and it has worked for hundreds of years. Um, so it's important to be, I think, open-minded, but also to realise if, if you're putting pressure on yourself because of the confines or the templates that you grew up with, you know, I grew up reading Woman's Day and, and listening to the Today Show and the news, and it was very much husband-wife and did someone cheat and then they break up. You know, it, it can be really confining for a lot of people. I think coming back to, we always bring it back to, kindness we always bring it back to authenticity and integrity rather than having those rules i'm i want to ask you a quick question carrie because a patient of mine and she will listen to this so hi if you're listening um 
A patient of mine is seeing a counsellor at the moment with her partner and the counsellor has suggested a weekly night where they have to make love. Now, I really found this interesting. I've also had a psychologist say that to me um, many years ago, that if you almost set a time and uh, look, I don't want to use the word force, but you know, there's that expectation that that's when you have sex in the relationship. It can, it can start things back up again. I see this as, yeah, a possible solution, but I also see some issues with it because you're taking away the cosmic and the urge and everything else. Um, what's, your, what's your view on that, Carrie Ann? Well, I think you probably know my view. But I anyone, do. Anyone yeah. is listening, um, let me go there. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, no way. There is no way that I would ever put a rule on sexual energy. Um, and, and, and and I would say that for any of our desires and our urges, even even eating, uh, sleeping. Any relationship, yeah. When you're going to dance in the lounge room. <laughs> I mean, in any any expression of your creative force, if there's a rule and a containment around it, that's the quickest way to shut it down. It has to be set free. It has to be like a wild horse that that runs wherever it needs to and is allowed to be rogue if it needs to and it can be it, it can run the gambit of any of the energies within the sexual spectrum. Um, so that if you want to have gentle, intimate, soul to soul, eye gazing, love making, do that. If you want to have, you know, throw me down while passionate lovemaking, do that. If you contain it, it's going to quickly run into distortion and then you will seek outside of your relationship. You will seek where you are having natural impulse with someone else because that's what's exhilarating. And so mm. it has to be exactly. set free. And if couples need to go through a period of time where they don't have any sex at all, there shouldn't be any of those constraints. Like I was saying about the rules you know, the unspoken rules in Australia where you got to have sex twice a week and this is what you do. If you need to go a few months without sex because you're in a deep healing process, you're restoring something within yourself, you're clearing abuse from the past. I mean, I know I've been, I mean, I've been celibate now for, I guess it's, well, it's probably two years. People probably, many people don't know that Chris and I actually split up back in 2020, mainly because of the huge galactivation that was going on. And um, we just decided that we weren't able to contain the energy of the upgrade, the spiritual upgrade that was going mm. on and maintain our very on again, very off again, 20 something year relationship. You know, it's definitely a beautiful soulmate. And many people obviously have trained with him here at My Health and do business with him in, in the other business that he does um, and he's been on the podcast and he remains a beautiful, beautiful friend because when you're soul connected, you don't ever really disconnect. And I know you two are brothers and, you know, we've had some sacred experiences, mm -hmm. the three of us together at Uluru and, and I've watched what you two went through, you know, basically getting a new heart from the feminine and, you know, we've been on some wild journeys. <laughs> um, but for me, um, you know, releasing that, relationship which was true soulmate unification to set myself free for the twin flame unification because I knew that's what was coming it has to align with this new wave of energy that we are moving into mm -hmm. and all of my downloads are about when the when twin flame reunion happens then it creates bliss codes here upon the grid of mother earth to light her up in a way that it it actually I can actually see it it shifts the axis we're off we're off tilt at the moment it shifts the axis to line up through the central sun through the galactic center and this is what creates the propulsion of her emergence into fifth dimensional consciousness so I'm like hmm who am I not to, who am I not to get on board that that journey and look it's challenging because to have to part ways with such a beautiful man who, you know, for me, he helped me heal so much um, sexual distortion because of being abused, sexually abused when I was young, when I was eight years of age. Um, and then I went really wild when I was um, in my early 20s. You know, I just, the, I was just so promiscuous because I was searching for a way to unravel what that abuse was about. And it created a really profound spiritual awakening for me. I will never be regretful of what I did because without those 
experiences, I wouldn't be who I am today. I think some people look at me now like 20, what, nearly 25 years into my health and they don't think I've got any issues. It's like, yeah, you should have seen me when I was around 20, 21 or even even earlier. Um, you know, I was, I was always wise and I could always read energy. I was always psychic. I always knew things and I always kept my spiritual practices up. But the other side of me was really exploring all of the darkness and what that meant and giving my sexual essence and seed away wherever, where, whoever would take it, you know, do you want it? You take it. You're nice to me. Hey, let's have sex. You know, it just, it was just completely out of control. Um, and I remember telling you once, Greg, and this would be a big revelation <laughs> to say publicly, but I remember living in London back in the day and uh, hooking up with someone from a nightclub and he, when he left, he left money on the bedside table <laughs> and I just was like, okay, so that's what he perceived me as, you know. I To him I was a prostitute and those sort of experiences really catapult you into well, deep shame for a start, but we know through the layers of consciousness, if you go to shame, it's like the it's like the bottom of the con scale of human consciousness, if we look at the teachings of Hawkins, and it it's, you'll either take yourself out of the game at that time, you'll implode and, 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 and possibly suicide, or you'll start rising and you'll you'll move all the way through to enlightenment. So we can't be we can't be scared of like really descending into the depths of our darkness because at the other end of the scale it goes into this profound light um so you know I, I was so blessed to have Chris in my life and you know to to help me to heal so much of that and then to have to part ways and just you know maintain aloneness for this last couple of years in pre you know preparing for what this twin flame is it's like you know it's 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 a big deal and um but it's joyous and it's exciting and it's and it's beautiful so, um, yeah, I can see all the comments coming in, guys. I'm sorry, I'm not getting them all up today. Having a good, having a good revelation. <laughs> I shall, um, I'll look at, there's another question there from Kyle. When we explore the vibration, when you reach that bliss, um, does the energy get wasted? Look, this is a really, really good topic to talk about with sacred erotica. I believe that our sexuality, erotica, that sacred energy, it, it can't be all about orgasm. And whether you're a gendered male or female, an orgasm can feel slightly different. Um, orgasm, this comes from the Chinese medicine perspective, but this also, it works in a lot of our different modalities. Orgasm is the ultimate opening of the portals. Now, when you open those portals, you are... I guess exposing yourself to a mass exodus of kundalini, of energy. So you all know, I would assume, how it feels to reach that state in both a, uh, in both a sacred union and also in a way that doesn't feel sacred. So, you know, that might be the difference between a one-night stand or just going through the motions with someone because you're really drunk and actually a union with someone that you've been courting and dating for weeks and weeks, and then it ends up being this really blissful, intense sexual experience. I will say for men, I'm, I, I come at a little bit more of a male perspective because I've probably read more about it because of myself being a gendered male. For men, the seminal fluid itself, not only does it contain our DNA, obviously, so it's part of that experience of creating life, but it holds so much kundalini and so much energy that if we are allowing ourselves to reach climax too much, and there's many different opinions on what's too much, I, I'm intuitive with it. Um, yes, we leak energy. So we start to, it's almost like adrenal fatigue and it becomes highly addictive, much the way as many drugs that stimulate us also become addictive. It's unsustainable, but the paradox is we want more of it. Um, so we as gendered males do need to be very careful of that. With females obviously being the receiver or anyone in the feminine role in a sexual, sexual union being the receiver of energy, you also need to be aware that, yes, your portals will be open, but also you have the risk of then receiving codes, receiving what I call codes or information, cosmic information. Um, hence, I think it's really important to have that 
intuitive understanding um, and communication around the union so that you are aware of the, you know, the intentions behind it. Um, it's interesting that you chatted about prostitution and this prostitution, pornography, um, sexual addiction. I really want to chat just briefly about that with you today, Carrie Ann, because you and I have both had experience I, with that. Because yeah. I'm going to let you have a really deep dive into that. I just want to say to Kyle about the ANC. Yes, it's a beautiful tantric practice about, and I echo everything that Greg said, and I would go as far as to say, and hold that mm. thought, Greg, because we need to come back to No, that's fine. Saying. I just, I agree, yeah. Mm. I want to say, yes, women can take in a lot of distortion through their male partners or, you know, if you're in a gay relationship, it, it doesn't matter because there's feminine masculine energies contained exactly. within marriages as well and we will talk about that further today um but yes the the woman can is meant to actually have she gets to have the fun actually it's been the opposite in the distortion mm -hmm. in the inverted realm where men are ejaculating all the time women aren't having many orgasms so in tantra women are meant to have the orgasms and she funnels that back through the man he's meant to contain the seed and use it as his life mm -hmm. force i mean there's nothing wrong with ejaculation because as greg said it's a seeding point as well so you can share codes between um you know, partners in the ejaculatory process. But the anking process is really powerful, particularly um, on your own, and you can do it in, in couples as well. But to bring the energy up to the heart chakra, let it go through the back of the heart. And so if you think of the ank key, I wish I had a picture we could put up, Kyle knows, um, comes over the head and it anks back into the heart. So you never lose the energy. So it's just, it's perpetuating and it's... Um, recycling the sexual energy so that's a really really great question mm. but greg mm. you need to get what you were about to say so that's <laughs> very good, <darling. laughs> you know i hear i hear so much judgment um and one thing about myself i'm i'm really and we were just chatting about this the other day on the phone carrie ann i'm i've become someone and one thing i'm happy with at the moment um, amongst other things is I really work on judgment constantly it comes back to yamas and niyamas you know I remember seeing I'll give you a couple of quick examples I remember seeing so much furor of so much anger about um Kim Kardashian sex tape I just finished watching a really interesting show on um uh, one of the streaming services about the Pamela Anderson Lee sex tape. Um, and one of the questions in the Pamela Anderson docu uh, you know, documentary kind of thing that I watched, it said to Pamela, she was upset because her tape had been stolen and Penthouse was going to use the images. And the lawyer said to her, well, what's the difference? You know, you've done Playboy and got paid for it. So if someone takes the photos of you in an intimate act with your husband and sticks them on a magazine, what's the difference? Um, I also remember seeing a really interesting image someone shared, a yoga teacher shared on Instagram, I think it was last year, Carrie Ann, you'll remember, of two photos. One was Kim Kardashian, one was Princess Di, and it said, raise your daughters to be Princess Di's, not to be Kim Kardashian's. And I thought, wow, there is always judgment around women. It's like you can't ever just be be free and be self. If you want to be sexually liberated, there's a taboo, a taboo around that. If you make a sex tape and that gets released, whether it's on purpose or not, then there's taboo around that. Um, but again, you know, this this archetype of Princess Di, yes, I was a big Princess Di fan, as many were growing up in the 80s. But again, that I'm just a good girl. I do all the right things. I keep my mouth shut. I, I don't think that that's something to aspire to. So if we get back to the question of pornography, sexual addiction um, and non-sacred erotica, all right, non-sacred sexual unions, um, the first thing to do is to remove shame and remove judgment. If you find yourself judging someone else, you know, if you're on Instagram or social media and you are offended by, you know, what someone's doing or how they're talking, firstly, I would say unfollow or scroll past, probably don't engage um, because even if someone is not coming from a place of being grounded, if they are being overtly sexual and it's not an authentic way, they don't need your comment. They don't need you to judge them. They're probably already judging themselves. Turn the finger inward as well and meditate on why that triggered you and, and why you feel triggered. How do you feel standing naked in front of the mirror and what's your sexual energy like? Um, and again, this, as, as we said at the start, this culture at the moment, I think a lot of it changed around the 60s and 70s. I remember, um, I wasn't alive, but I remember reading and, and watching a lot about the musical hair, the, the liberation of, um, you know, group sex and sexual energy and orgies in, this, in the 70s. And of course, the iconic song, you know, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And that came from the musical hair, which was famous, 
um, because the cast actually run through the audience naked. Um, you know, let's, we should do it. We should probably be in that musical by now, Carrie. I think it'd be amazing. <laughs> you and I running around naked. You know, time. Be time. The next, um, look, we've always wanted to go viral. I think that's we'll join us. <laughs> Anyone else want to get naked with us? <laughs> I think that'll be. I think that's all yeah. starting to show that the the energy is opening up. First, it was you know we can start to talk about gay relationships, and now people can start to have throuples if they want, or they can explore other unions. And um, I watched uh, a wedding recently where they didn't want to call it a wedding; it was a love day. People are starting to be a little bit more intuitive um, about it. Um, what were you going to say, Carrie? -Anne? Well, it it makes me think about Osho, who I absolutely I've had a I've had a bit of a an interesting relationship with him, which sounds funny because obviously I don't know him in the three D, but I certainly know him. He's one of my masters, and every time I go into the Akashic Records, he and Mother Mary are always there for me. They're my two masters. They sit there in the Akashic Records, they're like, "Welcome back! What 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 clearing work or what are we going to explore today?" So in other dimensions, I know him very well, and as a yogi, I was always drawn to reading his books and I just thought wow this, this guy's really outside of the box like why is he talking about all this sexual liberation and you know maybe we should be trying to contain it because when I first got into yoga at um, age well I, I first got into it at age 16 but I first started teaching it at age 22 after my breakdown of all my chaos in London and promiscuity and everything like that and uh, so I was ashamed of my sexuality and he really mm. triggered me because he was saying be liberated within it that's that's the impulse of life you cannot shut this down and I think I was in a phase of, of trying to shut it down because I knew it had taken me so far into distortion and into chaos and and so the best thing to do was just suppress it um, but I always was drawn to him and then I found out about all the orgies and everything like that that he had um, in his ashram and I was like no he's really no he really is laced with darkness this isn't right and it's as I get older and I'm a little bit wiser, I'm aware that whilst I don't wish to participate in orgies, for the 70s, and this is what was so key about what you said, for the 70s, it was a really important part of the initiatory process that the collective is going through. We had to have that. We had mm -hmm. to break away from the 60s Stepford Wives. You know, yes. it's interesting said Lady Di and Kim Kardashian. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to create polarity all the time. Yes. Oh, it's this or this. No, it's actually through the middle. It's both. Exactly, so, yeah. And, exactly. and so we needed that time in the 70s. And uh, I've spoken to Osho since. You know, everyone knows I'm... I'm I can talk to any beings in the galaxy, it doesn't matter where you're 3D, 5D, 7D, I'm like, I can chat to you, you know, it's not an issue for me. But I've spoken to him since and he said, yeah, actually, you know, it went really awry. Even, even he didn't intend it to go like that. Um, but he said it was important because it had to push the boundary. So he actually fulfilled his mission in a really sacred and beautiful way, despite the fact that it went out of control and people misused their sexual energy within it. But unless you push boundaries a lot of the time, you don't find out where that middle is. And I believe with the golden age of Gaia, you know, they were singing it <laughs> back in, in hair, the, the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm was coming and so now we get to use all the polarities and we get to put them together as one and it's something that you're very expert in Greg because you're an acupuncturist you know every day when you are in because I know you're an intuitive healer I know that yeah you've got all the medical training but I know when you do your acupuncture you are reading the energy map of that person and you are you know how to bring the polar opposites together as one and you see it time and time again the profound and maybe we call it miraculous healings that go on, whether it's with our yoga students, whether it's in your acupuncture clinics, whether it's with our healers, uh, trainees, doesn't really matter. We're seeing people just shed seemingly dastardly illnesses and just step up into the light because we know they're bringing polar opposites together. So tell us about yin and yang and how all that works with atoms and you know, let's let's get it. <laughs> let's chat about it all. There's so much to talk about. Um, firstly, I'm going to say, yeah, you, you mentioned this yesterday. This we're probably going to have to have a follow up to this podcast. So just stay tuned. I, I'm getting the download already. This will be a trilogy. I think we'll have a part two and we'll have a part three. So if if you're watching this podcast um, in incoming days and you're thinking, oh darn it, I wanted to answer, I wanted to ask 
some questions or comments, just stay tuned. Um, I won't say 100%, but I have a feeling there's going to be a follow-up to this because there is so much to talk about um, and it's hard to do it all in an hour. Look, Chinese medicine, the, the Tao is, or the monad, is it always a fluid movement between yin and yang. Um, this helped me a lot when I was studying Chinese medicine with my own sexuality, growing up, you know, with this really confused um, take on who I was and what I should be doing. Um, you know, the first probably, I would say, at least 17 or 18. If, uh, before, I, before I say this, Carrie, Ann, I'm going to tell you something because you might not know this. But as a for my age group, so I'm, I'm 40 now, for my age group, it's still the number one question I get. And I think generations that are younger than me probably won't get it. Generations that are older than me, it's probably still a little bit taboo and a bit sad. Um, you know, I've got friends in their 50s and 60s in the queer community who were part of, you know, some horrific things in Sydney, getting beaten up by the police at Mardi Gras, things like that. You know, I've got younger generations who are non-binary and they don't even like to call themselves, you know, man or woman. Um, where I am, I can tell you the number one thing I still get asked after a few drinks at a party is, so when did you know you were gay? Or um, And I, I don't mind, I love it. Or even at the even at the um, My Health Retreat last year, one of the um, uh, one of the retreat attendees, one of our teacher trainees said, I don't think I ever really even knew you were gay. I didn't even know you were married, you know. Um, and, and everyone wants to know how did you come out and that type of thing. I'm what just going to butt in for a second because yeah. when you're teaching and when you're healing, you're really androgynous. You're not, yeah, like I yeah. think I, I, we're honestly, a foreign boy inside yeah. of you, but actually, yeah. You, yeah. Anyway, carry on. Uh, look, I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, mannerisms, the way you talk, your personality, it can it can mould and I, I don't have a problem with that. I spent so many years moulding myself to try to be this way and, you know, then you do your teacher training and you try to mould yourself to be that way and then you're, yeah, then you're doing something else. Um, I, I allow myself to mould. It doesn't really bother me if occasionally my mannerisms go a little bit more feminine and then occasionally my mannerisms go a little bit more masculine. What I don't do, though, is put the performance on because of whoever is listening. That's the difference. So, but I, but I will say, um, if I'm around my um, my husband Kelsey, he calls them my dancer friends. Um, you know, if I'm around them, it's you know, you'd, you'd think I was a drag queen. You know, it's I'm sashaying around and I flip my hair and it's all this stuff. You know, and then I can I can have a beer with my dad and a couple of his mates, and I can be much more in my masculine and you know tell some dirty jokes and you know scratch my crotch if I really want to. Um, yeah. But again, it doesn't necessarily need to be a performance. I'm, I'm happy to be a bit fluid with my mannerisms. And personality. Again, it's your authenticity, isn't it? It's the two poles. Uh, yeah, I, look, I'm not perfect, but I try to be. Yeah, I try to be just authentic with with who with how I am. Um, but from zero to eighteen, I was I was in the box of not even understanding that that was an option for me to explore. You know some kind of sexual union with a male. So I was out of that box up until 18. I um, always had girlfriends and dated girls. At 18, it kind of shifted rapidly because I went to university to study classical dance and there was men holding hands and there was men kissing and it was the most shocking thing to me. Growing up in the 80s, we didn't have, um, aside from one gay character on a show called Dawson's Creek, there were no gay characters. I didn't know any gay people. I never heard the word gay except when I was teased at school for being gay, which I still didn't really know what it was back then. Um, so that was, it was just really fascinating kind of time of life and then it, it, as soon as I was open to it at age 18 there was probably a year or two where I, I was happy to explore it a little bit and then I shut the door around oh, as soon as I went overseas which is probably about about 20 or 21 um, instead of going all promiscuous I just kind of went I can't even bother thinking about that I'm too busy you know doing what I want to do um, in terms of working so my 20s were actually pretty uh, sexually limited, to be honest, it didn't. It didn't bother me. There was the odd encounter every now and then, and I, look, I still had relationships. I had a couple of beautiful relationships in my twenties. So in those relationships, I was happy to be sexual with that person. Um, but aside from that, you know, I, I wasn't that connected to my sexuality. It really wasn't until I met my. Did you, now. Within, did you feel it within yourself personally in your alone time, yeah. or had you uh, of trying to I, figure out what this? Path of being gay was about. Yeah, okay. I read a book, another book. If you've done teacher training with me, you'll know that every time I talk, I say I've read a book 
or I've watched a YouTube video. You know, I've done, I've been at uni twice and I'm, I'm at uni doing my master's now a third time. And I, I swear most of what I read comes from a book or from you, most of what I learn comes from you, Carrie Ann, or a book or YouTube. I read a book called The End of Gay, okay? And it was a PhD thesis, but it's turned into a book. And I read it, oh, at least 20, 25 years ago. I was quite young. And it talks about the the um, the word gay and what it means. And the, the author who I guess identifies as, as being gay basically broke it all down. And I just resonated with it so much. Um, I never came out of the closet. I don't personally use the word gay. Um, I've never been asked and I've actually never said I am gay. It, it never resonates with me. What I do say is I'm in a relationship with a male and I'm married to a male. I said that to someone the other day because the, the, even the name Kelsey is quite commonly a, femi- a female name. So I'll say, oh, you know, I'm married to someone, their name's Kelsey. Oh, what does she do? And I'll know oh, it's, it's a male. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong if you do identify, but as soon as I found that label come on, um, that label come, it ne- and you know this, Carrie Ann, it just never, it just never sat with me. So some of you listening might find that surprising. Um, you told also- me so much, Greg, about that, about not giving it a label, and I guess because of today's conversation, yeah. we are giving it labels, so people listening, which is fine, which is fine. Yeah. It's just like you it's just like spirituality. You know, yeah. we, we call it we call it yoga just because someone said, oh, well, the Sanskrit word yoga, which means yoking. Or union so we say i'm a yoga teacher you know everything has a name because you know we speak english it makes it easier i get it but the 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 word gay doesn't bother me but i don't choose to have the label upon myself um i haven't had a sexual relationship with a female um but i also i'm i can be attracted to women i find women really attractive i understand that women are very sexual and to answer your question carrie Ann, yeah in my 20s um, what I noticed was from the early 20s to the late 20s, if I was exploring my own sexuality, aka solo, it went from something that was just guilt and shame, get it over and done with, to um, more of a, yeah, a, a really blissful, sacred kind of fun experience in the late 20s. Um, and then meeting, I was 29 when I met Kelsey, who I'm now with, and Kelsey was quite different he was quite sexually open in his 20s so we were a really really nice match because then throughout we've been together 11 years now throughout our relationship we've we've taught each other a lot we're very open with each other and for us the most important thing is having honest communication we're not perfect with that but everything comes down to having honest communication but i want to just quickly answer your question because i realized i've chatted a bit and rambled a bit the yin and yang, when you're looking at the acupuncture um, template, when you're looking at the Tao, um, yin being feminine, Mother Earth, yang being masculine, I like to refer to it as the relationship between, this will sound a bit strange, the moon and Earth, okay? So the energy of the moon, the energy of the Earth, gravity is the magnetic pull. We feel gravity and it's the magnetic pull. It's the same with sacred sexual um, unions. There's friction involved, but there has to be that yin and yang Pull. So yes, it's the same with um, quantum physics. When you're looking at um, positrons and electrons, when you're looking at the friction that's in um, that is everything that actually that actually makes our hologram, that makes our reality. And so when you look at it that way, labels don't really need to apply um, anymore. We don't need to give everything such a rigid template. It's more, hey, what's the opposite energy? And I always seek that opposite energy if that makes sense yeah and that's really twin flame union as well it's it's the equal and opposite uh energies that then merge back together as one so it can be same-sex marriage it can be uh you know again let's go past the labels let's just let's just call it the there's nothing there's nothing there's nothing wrong with labels but yeah yeah, twin flame is good but even twin flame you know um I, i know you love that term for me i find it and I think I'm still learning a lot about it. I need to go back and watch our, our, your podcast again, Carry On on Twin Flame, because it was such a good one. But you have to watch it a couple of times because there's so much information in it. It's um, sacred geometry, yeah. It's, 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 a bit of a, it's the sacred it's a bit of geometry. We need to change it up for divine or tonal counterpart. And I really, personally, Ooh, I, I like actually that. prefer 
hormonal counterpart. But do you know, Greg, there's so many people that say to me, like, I'll do a post and I think in my world I'm making sense and I know a lot of people get it. People literally say to me, I don't know what that means. Like, I know I like it, <laughs> but I don't know what it means. It's right. like if I go too high dimensional, which is really where I want to sit with my language, it, whew, it's over the top. Might, and people and that's true. So labels are still I want to bring it into that. human language. But then, of course, people pick up on terms and then it gets distorted again. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. but tonal counterpart, because me, we're, we're Andromeda and star seeds, as I said. So we understand we're more aligned to feeling and music, harmonics. Mm. That's how we decode what creational forces are. So we love chanting, we love singing, we love dancing. You know, that's that's who we are. Other people have different templates that they come in with. Um, but tonal counterpart for me really makes sense because it's octaves. It's when the octaves mm. merge or create. So you've got your universe, one verse in self, one verse in self, merging with another universe, one verse within self, creating this this beautiful harmonic together and when we see it with the heros gamos whether we see that in the kundalini spiraling within self to create our angel wings but when the the tonal counterparts of the divine counterparts come together that fusion of equal and opposite you know counterparts creates then this it's like this uh well it's like the infinite helix the 144 infinite helix of dna I, I'm decoding at the moment that's really what's going on because yeah. I believe many of us have already gone from two strands of DNA to 12 strands of DNA. You're seeing the people, there'll be people who are listening, you're seeing the people who understand these kind of conversations. It's always been within them. Their so-called junk DNA has switched back online. But how do we go from the 12 DNA straining into the 144 infinite helix? Well, for me, it's, it's, it's the union um, with that divine counterpart uh and i don't necessarily think it's everyone's pathway uh someone asked me a question yesterday they they sort of felt it was was their pathway they knew they were with a soulmate but they knew they had to make space for the twin flame i'm like if you know that's your pathway that's your pathway like that's as simple as it is some people are here on the planet to have a solo journey that's your pathway um, some people are comfortable in the soulmate relationships. They're often the people that you marry and have children with. That's your pathway. Um, because twin flaming, it's intense. It's going to blow mm. your circuitry to pieces. You mm. have to be upleveled so high within yourself. You probably have to have spent a long time alone in the dark mm. night. Agree. Oh, really diving into the depths of your own depravity and the universal depravity because there's a lot of it, let's be honest, on the planet. We're talking about having to really decode and understand why dark lords simply take sexual energy off babies. Like you have to know what that's about before you are capable of integrating a twin flame union because, again, if you don't go right into the depths of what creational darkness is about and it is part of creation unfortunately we think well why why are we creating such atrocity it's mm. heinous it's, it's disturbing yes it is yes it is how can you hold how can you be in the fire of that without it burning you and how can you emerge from that like the phoenix rising out of the ashes and and only those souls are ready for twin flame union and every soul will come into twin flame union again but it depends on on where on the continuum of consciousness because it may not be in this lifetime but there you know there there will be many that will union at this time to to activate that that earth grid that's not an easy path, you know. That's a very challenging path. There was like, oh, I want my twin flame, like bring it on, like we're going to have sex all the time. And no, because like, it's, it's not that simple. You will have sex all the time, but you won't get to that point until you have done all this other dark shadow work. And, uh, yep. you know, so unless you're prepared for that, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's a beautiful, orgasmic, blissful pathway, but to get to it, wow. You have, to, you have to know how to traverse the whole galaxy, really, and understand how creation works. I read something interesting. Um, I've read a lot this week about <laughs> sacred erotica because I've been researching a bit more. It's something I'm really interested in. We know the human resonance, you know, it usually rests on about 7.83 hertz. So I often say that love is not necessarily transactional, right? You know, we don't, we don't need to get love from someone. 
oh, he stopped loving me, I fell out of love, he left me, so now I'm heartbroken. This is all based on transactional transactional love. If you've read the book Love Languages, it's a bit of a hype book at the moment. I love it. You know, it, it's a fantastic book. But it's it's talking about demonstrating the act of love. It, it's That's not real love. When our heart, which is a frequency transmitter and receiver, when our heart tunes into the Schumann resonance, when we are grounded to the earth, we feel 7.83 hertz. This is the frequency of love. Making love must be with someone who is also tuned into the frequency of the earth. If you, if you are deficient, so say your energy is down, you are going to try to find someone who is toxic and their energy is up so that you can try subconsciously to balance, to come back to the frequency of the earth. It won't work though, because you'll just go the other way. Um, if you're really overbearing and if you're really intense, you're gonna try and find someone passive to come back to that balance. So making love is always is, is to me a lot about trying to find someone where you can find that frequency. Um, I, I just had a picture come to me. A singing bowl is still a singing bowl, even if it's not playing. But when a singing bowl is struck, it creates the frequency. And this is making love. I'm still a person when I'm not in orgasmic state. So is my sexual partner. They're still a person. But if we can come together in harmonics, it creates that frequency. And that's that's making love. Um, what I wanted to ask you, Carrie ann is how does this relate to the, we chat a little bit about acupuncture, yin and yang, and, and the kundalini because Kyle asked that great question about our energy and if we if we don't anchor the energy, if we allow it to, to go out there, can we get depleted? But what about the yogic world? You mentioned a little bit about, and we're not going to go there because we've chatted about this in other podcasts, but there has been some yogic influences and gurus who've taken advantage of the yogic energy. Um, but with your experience with tantra, and your experience in the yogic world, um, what would be the benefit of being, I, I guess, a little bit more celibate or um, restrictive with your energy as opposed to being a little bit more out there and, and just being free, freer with the sexual energy? Just chat a little bit about that. I'm fascinated to hear what you think. Yeah, I love that. And, again, I feel it comes back to being so aligned with yourself and your own rhythms mm. and intuition that you know when to be on and when to maybe turn the tap off um, because yeah. both are perfect and equal experiences. Um, it's, it's, it's about being attuned to self. And any sexual abortion, any taking of energy, any of these yoga so-called masters, well, they're not masters, let's be honest, but that's how they got away with taking energy off their students because people propelled them into the master template. They put them up on the pedestal and then that created its own loop of energy back where they were so puffed up with energy. They just thought, yeah, I can take from multiple mm students and 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 it's okay these students are revering me they're adoring me you know the student is actually wanting it a lot of the time um and so the teacher gets very confused so so the those two forces come together as one uh in a distorted geometric pattern however the teacher always gets blamed. And I don't know, you know, I'm not into yes, I'm not into yes. anyone being a victim. You know that about me. And and I yeah, know that I about agree. we don't believe in anyone being a victim, you know, and that might shock some people because people wanna they wanna be the victim because that's how they get a feed of energy. But don't you know this is my story? I'm like, yeah, well, put your story down mm. and let's just deal with reality because this happened for a perfect and higher reason. You know, I spoke about my distortion with my sexuality. Well, I could be I could be that person today saying, I got sexually abused and, you know, mm. this is why I'm the way I am and, and, and everyone feed me because I'm the victim and, and you know, I'll get mm. away with bad behaviour because, you know, I've got a reason and I've got a crutch to. No, why? Mm. I, no. Mm. That, was that, that was that perverted idiot's problem, what he did to me, um, mm. you know, flick. Mm cut the cord, send you on your way, you go pay your karma there, buddy boy, because it ain't pretty, and I'll go mm. over here, the goddess that I am, and uh, you're not going to hold me back, not for one second, one for, not for one moment. I allowed him to for many years, and, you know, I got myself into those dark places that I spoke about, but the awakening was so profound and so powerful that these days I just say, hey, thank, thank you, thank you for being the abuser in my life, um, because without that I wouldn't know what I know, I wouldn't get it. Um, so it's all it's all perfect and no one's a victim. But, yeah, it's really interesting and, oh, my God, there's so many gurus that have just mm. 
Mm. You know, they imposed themselves on their students. But we have to remember because I've been in the circles. You know, I've I've mm-hmm. we've run retreats for what twenty odd years. Mm. Uh, I've seen it. I really love having you as my um, as my buddy at at the top of the you know the not that there's any top I shouldn't say like that but you know the senior teachers because you're so aligned within yourself you would never on a retreat take anyone's power but I've also worked with really hot yoga guys like hotty hot hot can do all the postures you know they're they're showing off in front of the in front of the female students and the women are just like oh god you know I've seen it on retreats where yeah (laughs) I always get good it could easily, yeah, it, it could easily off. get distorted. It could easily get distorted. I've yeah. seen I've seen it all. I mean, I've, I've also had a couple of situations, um, you know, where I've been single myself and had really hot male students and I'm like, oh, just watch yourself here, Karen. Yeah, watch yourself. They're feeding me with a lot of attention and they're wanting to, yeah. you know, who knows what they want from me really. All they know is they, they sit there listening to me talk all day and they've got gaga eyes and, um, you know, they don't necessarily want me. They just want that spiritual charge. Um, so you know, I've 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 made a couple yeah. of mistakes. I've never enacted on anything physically, but I know that I've tried to get something going, and then it's it hasn't it hasn't yeah. been in alignment. Um, so yeah. you know, I understand how it happens, but it's not. I, I love these conversations because we can talk distortion, and then we can talk purity, but let's remember distortion leads to purity. So there's no right, wrong, good, bad. It's, it's all perfect. But if you're sick of your own behaviour and if you're sick of being in distortion with your sexuality, there are so many things you can do right here, right now to draw yes. yourself into alignment and to have that creational orgasmic wave impulse running through you perpetually where you don't have to quell it at the base chakra, where you can learn how to conduct it up through all of the chakras, through the kundalini forces and ultimately merge with the divine. And, again, to echo what Greg said at the beginning, you can do that within yourself. You don't need mm. a partner. But a partner may be coming for you too mm. once, you've, once you've mastered that. I wanted to share, because I know we're coming up to, to time to wrap up, but I wanted to share two quick things um, before I hand it over to you, Carrie, and to, to kind of close off. So the first thing I wanted to share, you touched before on Uluru. Uluru was an important time, not only for me and for you, but for the world, because it kind of marked in my mind, and we were there, it really marked a rebirth between masculine and feminine energy. We know we've come out of the 2000 year cycle. We're in the age of Aquarius. We know that we've also come through a 26,000 year cycle here on this planet. The universe has altered because of this. Um, I do think that a lot of what has occurred, particularly in the in the more recent years, if you go chronological 3D time, in the more recent years, the Me Too movement, sexual liberation, GLBTQIA positive, as we now have to say, all of the rights and the equality and and everything else you know there's a bathroom bill um, in america about what bathroom you can use you know there's always a heated debate just be aware if you're being pulled to the left or to the right if something is right or something is wrong and come back to that midline ground yourself because because what we what we learned and this was from of course stephen evan strong it was from the um, First Nations, the uh, original people, elders who were with us at Uluru, what we learned and what we saw and what we experienced was a rebirth of feminine energy, was a rebirth of the receiver energy, whether you're gendered male or female, and the giver energy. Um, And it really is going to uh, it, it's going to change things from here through the next 2,000 years and the next 26,000 years. Things will things will shift. We're going to see some big shifts. Um, but sacred sexual energy is at the base of our life on earth. It is about politics, finance, business, the spiritual world, the physical world, geography, the weather. You cannot have anything that is not influenced by sacred sexuality because it is the crux of what we experience here in the 3D earth. And the second thing I wanted to quickly say is um, I'd love to give some super quick tools if you're sitting there. I know there's going to be people watching this who perhaps have never felt um, a, a cosmic union, who've, who've never really been connected to their sexuality. They're too old. They're too fat. They're too young. They're, they're hiding. They're, they've got guilt and shame. They're being teased. They're not connected to themselves. I heard a, um, a patient say to me the other day, and she's this beautiful patient, I think maybe 20 or 21. She's so, con- she's so um, 
disconnected from her own sexual organs because of, you know, so many different reasons and she doesn't even know where to start. Um, luckily, she's done yoga teacher training now, so that's fantastic. It's a good way to start. To, to understand chakras and to understand kundalini is a good way to start. Um, but I also would say just get used to your own physical body. Listen to the judgment that comes up. Um, I'm naked a lot of the time. You know, I live in an apartment with glass and I'm sure there's many people around here who've gone, oh, yeah, there's that naked guy that walks around. I love being naked. I never used to be. I never used to love it, though. Um, I've had many nights by myself in the bathtub and, you know, that's great, too, because you get to know what feels good and, and what what are your erogenous or your erotic pressure points on your body it's not just the genitalia of course um, but get to know yourself and listen to the inner critic that comes up that's constantly telling you why you're not sexy why you're not attractive why no one would love you um, because that's all that inner working and when you slowly start to dissolve that it's a slow process as you'll um, attest to carry in but when you start to dissolve that a little bit you won't care as much about what someone else thinks and you'll actually the paradox of that is you'll find someone who does um, fit that, fit that, um, I guess, cosmic union. Let's get rid of the template though, that you need to be, to be happy. You've got to be in a married monogamous relationship for 50 years with enough in your super to go for a cruise before you retire. Let's get rid of that. Cause that's old. That paradigm's gone. A successful, I've had a successful relationship that went for a couple of days. It was fantastic. I've also had a, you know, marriage that went for 11 years. And if it ends tomorrow, it was fantastic as well. Get rid of the rules and get back to, I guess, the cosmic energy that is in um, within you. But I'm sure we're going to be back for another podcast as well on this topic because it's just so interesting. Oh, God, I love it. You know, yeah, I'm glad you said we're going to do a trilogy because there's so much more to be said, so much more. So uh, let's mm. just all stay tuned for the next one. And as Greg said, send your um, send your questions in to me or to Greg. Uh, I know mm. a lot of people don't like to comment publicly and particularly these kind of podcasts, I, I get why. So, you know, just, just private message us or, or email us. Um, I do want to pop up your website as well, Greg, um, because people can certainly, if you're on the Gold Coast, you can uh, come and have an acupuncture session with Greg. So it's www. Let me just say, I'll just put the Ozacu in, um, ozacu.com. Yeah, dot com dot au. Um, uh, I offer metaphysical healings, which really do work with this sacred sexual energy as well. Chakra balancing. Um, thanks, Carrie Ann. So there's the link there. You can book in. Um, people can do online with you as well, because I know you've yeah, got. I do. And, I do, you know, I do, yeah, I do yeah. online um, online healing consults um, that are really. I've got patients in America, I've got patients um, in Asia, and I've got lots around Australia um, as well. And it's it's similar to this where we just chat, where we find that um, connection and what's needed. And I like to think of myself as a bit of a um, info desk for the spiritual world because I've dabbled in so much. I can recommend books, videos, courses. I'm happy to kind of point you um, in the right direction. I'm extremely um, open with discussing um, sexuality and sacred sexuality, sacred erotica. And the other thing is there's plenty of books. There's plenty of other podcasts. Uh, there's another podcast, I can't think of the name right now, that discusses um, uh, sexuality that's very, very open and it really helped me a lot with mine as well. So um, even if you don't feel comfortable talking to your best friend about it yet or talking to your yoga teacher about it, get used to you exploring it and just get rid of the guilt and get rid of the shame. Start to um, transmute and alchemize that guilt and shame. It's not yours to carry. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, darling. Well, I adore you. I love you. I thank you. And uh, we will be back for part two of three, I like that, of uh, Sacred Erotica. So much love uh, to all the people who tuned in live. Yeah, and, thanks uh, so much for those who commented as well. We, re we really love it. We really question. appreciate it. Yeah, reach out if uh, you have any questions for the next one. Namaste, everyone. Namaste.